Now, why am I telling you this extraordinary um, story when it comes to bone infection? Well, because when one germ congregates, when one germ settles there, and another one settles next to it, as long as they're not communicating with each other, nothing much will happen. But if there are a large number of them congregated, and they start to communicate with each other using the equivalent of mobile phones, and for those who want to know, the term is quorum sensing, when they start to communicate with each other, they then switch on gang behavior, okay? Just like the hoodies on the corner might become aggressive. And when these germs switch on gang behavior, they produce toxins. And the toxins produce pus, they produce pain, and they start to cause the device slowly to loosen over a period of weeks or months. But that process is critically dependent on the ability of these rather innocuous skin germs, because we're all walking around with them, these rather innocuous skin germs need to be able to communicate with each other and switch on toxic behavior, but like the mobile phone story. Um, and so in truth, there is no real difference between what was happening to this poor chap and the implantation of that device. Exactly the same principles and exactly the same risks of introdu introduction of infection applied in both cases. Now, I realize that I need to give you some time to ask questions. So I'm not, I think, uh, maybe what, yeah, let's just, uh, I, I'm going to show you this. Um, I'm going to show you this slide, which is something that I that I put up um, typically uh, when talking to colleagues. So I have to say, uh, not usually to members of the public, but just to acknowledge that we don't always do the right thing in medicine. But what we always do do is we give patients without serious infection too many antibiotics of the wrong sort. We give patients without infection no antibiotics. We sometimes don't sort out the basics before we start giving people antibiotics. If we detect problems in our services and, our, and the way we manage patients, we often don't fix them, okay? We're all guilty of that. We often, if you look at uh, surgeons and physicians around the country uh, dealing with any sorts of problems, including infections, they will work very, very hard to fix the problems, but they will always work in the same way. We will become trapped in the ways that we work. And that isn't necessarily the best way to do things. We also tend to become trapped by our own agenda. So sometimes it's very difficult for people to, or a hospital, to say, actually, we need to work in a different way, or within, in a different organization, or with a different structure. And I'm not saying this about the NSC in particular, it's a completely generic comment. Physicians often, and surgeons often work as solo practitioners. They may not talk to their colleagues. They may not learn from their mistakes. Physicians may pretend that what they see before them is not a surgical disease, but really it is. Surgeons may pretend that what they see before them is not an infection. It's just a bit of discharge that's going on for a bit too long. I mean, it's, I, I, from some of the knowing smiles here, I'm sure some of everyone's come across this. Um, and we all hope it will go away, okay? We're all human beings, we just hope this is well, that's going to stop it right now, and that's um, There is a practice of more is better, okay? So I, just by way of illustration, I would say, is we sometimes inherit patients who've had 15 months of intravenous antibiotics. 15 months, goodness. I mean, that's longer than the preparation for the 2012 Olympics, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, what most people would conclude after one or two months of antibiotics is, it doesn't work, it doesn't work, okay? But some people, you become trapped in that, and you, you don't <coughs> keep it. And so you, you're trapped in your own agenda, and you keep giving more and more antibiotics. The other problem for all of us, and I'm, I'm just as guilty, and I say this to myself often, uh, often enough, is that we may recognize the type B host in others. In other words, we may readily spot the failings in others around us, but we quite often don't spot the failings in ourselves. And if medicine, and when I say that, I mean physicians and surgeons want to be better, we need to recognize the defects in ourselves and in our systems. Um, I'm not sure who's responsible for this, but if we, if we always do what we always did, we will always get what we always got. <laughs> Um, now, I'm not going to tell you about my business because you will get no chance to ask me any questions if you 
did have any thinking about that. But I thought I would, I would just, yeah, I would just tell you one thing. The thing about quorum sensing, the mobile phones, okay, the business whereby um, harmless germs talk to each other to become harmful, um, was actually first discovered um, in this particular um, tiger prawn, which is, you can eat it, it's, um, you can go to Australia, it's on the menu. And what was noted uh, from the tiger prawn is that if you have it in a tank and you have a whole lot of tiger prawns, some of them will start to glow on the inside and some won't. And what they worked out was going on was that the they had an organism living in their gut which had the ability to switch on luminescence in order to produce a bit of light. But it didn't do that until it detected it had enough mates. When it had enough mates, it switched on the gang-like behavior and started to produce light. And that was really the discover discovery of quorum sensing or mobile phone gang behavior. The other um, illustration that I'm showing you over here is this particular red seaweed, which is also from Australia, is very unusual. As far as I'm aware, it's the only seaweed in the world which is not slimy. It's rough. If you touch it, it's rough. And the reason it's rough is because it doesn't have slime on it. But the reason it doesn't have slime on it is because it produces a chemical that stops the quorum sensing. It stops the gang-like behavior between slime-producing bacteria, and so you can't produce slime on the seaweed. Now, why is this so interesting? Well, in principle, if you could block oral sensing on artificial devices, in principle, you might be able to present, prevent all artificial devices from becoming infected. And in fact, there's already been some, work, so that's a really exciting um, potential development, and there's been some work done on this uh, involving some germs and sheep at the moment um, to show you can reduce the rate of infection in artificial devices by about 75%. Um, so, an exciting um, area for the future. I think that, um, yes, that is my last slide. <laughs> I never know if that exactly what we should do. Anyway, I would be delighted to take any questions. Lady in red. So are you saying that you can only get a bone infection if the skin has been cut? In the first world now, the vast majority of bone infection is as a result of the skin being cut. You can get a bone infection uh, by germs from the bloodstream spreading around into the bone. But most bone and joint infection now probably arises as a result of surgery. So although it's rare and surgery is successful, nevertheless, that's probably the commonest mechanism for getting it. Children um, will get it typically through an infection spreading in the bloodstream and then setting out in the long bones, uh, typically of the legs. <coughs> historically, that would have been much more important. When you look in the pre-antibiotic era, that would often have been fatal for both adults and children. It's extensive disseminated blood-borne infection spreading to multiple bones. We almost never see that presentation anymore. In fact, I can think of only one patient, adult, who's presented like that in the last day. 